Good evening, my name is Luke Sala and this is Mister Media. We are again talking with Joel Farb, Dr. Hemmelstein. He is a searcher for experience, wisdom, the divine inspiration all over the world. And today we are talking about purpose in life and why we're seeking purpose. Now, you have been traveling all over the world. Uh, you're an American. I am, by you're birth. You're also at birth. You're also Jewish. Um, but you are also an Arikan. Correct. Can you explain what that is? Arika is a mystical school formed in Arika, Chile. Uh, in the but that's where the name comes from. That's right. Uh, Arika means open door uh, in the local uh, uh, indigenous language. I believe it's Aymara, but it could be Quechua. Anyway, uh, it was the inspiration of a man named Oscar Chazo, a Bolivian who had studied all over the world various uh, meditation and um, spiritual practices. He had a divine inspiration, went into a spiritual coma, came out of it with the idea that a school would form. Uh, a number of West Coast folks came down in 1970 through the uh, influence of Claudio Naranjo, who was also a Chilean by birth. But he invited people like John Lilly, Correct. the man who wrote The Center of the Cyclone, right. things like that. To uh, And these people went to Chile and became a mystical school. Now, mystical school, mystery school. That rings bells for me for what the Greeks had. They had schools of teaching, communities, neo-Pythagorean schools that were happening in Italy and in Greece. Uh, we have the Elysium Mystery School, which seemed to have been more of a an initiation into other states of consciousness, where people would go, prepare for a few months, get into, get some experience. Some people say drug-induced experience, that they couldn't talk about it, but it would change their view on the world. Mm -hmm. That's my idea of mystery schools. Through the Middle Ages, we had mystery schools where people were, you know, you could say these are convents, these are monasteries where people would dedicate themselves to seeking the truth and mostly a spiritual, religious thing. Orientation. Yes. Yes. Now, how does the Arika Mystery School fit in with that image? Um, well, I believe that it would have remained esoteric. Uh, only a small number of people would have heard of it, and even now a small number of people have heard of it. But it, uh, but because the world is in such a situation that we find ourselves that the uh, ecological collapse, the overpopulation, the threat of nuclear holocaust, um, the uh, continued need for humans to be unkind to other humans, uh, has resulted in many people manifesting a, an externally spiritual side. So the, the esoteric, which means basically hidden knowledge becomes exoteric. Exactly. Now, we have seen over, say, in this century, we have seen mystery schools or at least movements in that same direction, like the Golden Dawn England, Blavatsky, Madame Blavatsky, that then we had the Gurdjieff Correct. work. He had mystery schools where the word work was came out you had to work on yourself you had to develop your own um, awareness basically his thing was very much becoming the observer of yourself mm -hmm. and seeing where you are not aware where you are on automatic mode mm -hmm. sleeping as right. you could call it now he formed various groups in the world new york places i think and, and london um, Paris and Moscow also. Yeah, but he died in '49 or something like that. Uspensky made his work famous. That was a mystery school, and that also has influenced Oscar Icazo, as I understand. Uh, well, there seem to be some um, parallel roots between uh, Gurdjieff and Icazo. Um, and I then we're specifically talking about the Sufi knowledge. 
well, this is another question. Was it the Sufi knowledge or was it some other knowledge that came by way of the Zoroastrians in the Mesopotamian Valley? All kinds of brotherhoods and places where Gurdjieff seemingly searched for the miraculous, but in fact searched for the divine knowledge, got some of it, but some other people might have gotten it. The idea, I think, that I've read something about Oscar Icazo is that his grandfather left him a library in which much of that knowledge was available. Oh, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, what well, that was in one of the articles, that, that in fact his inspiration from when he was very young, 13 or even after, what which happens with many of these enlightened masters or whatever you call them, is that at, I think at age six he had an experience right. about entering a different reality, whatever he started searching, this library that he got from his father-in-law, then later when he was 18 or 19 and he met some people who were right. influenced by Gurdjieff and others and he became part of that circle which crystallized his understanding. Right. But what basically brought his work out in, into common knowledge in this debate actually was the fact that he used a thing called the Enneagram. Correct. Which is a system of personality typing, of looking at um, processes both in the world and in our mind that seem to have a similarity where this gives an explanation but that came out as a personality typology by people like um, um, Alan Palmer, Helen Palmer and uh, Claudio who brought it out later mm -hmm. some people that are part of the original Rika work put it out in the world well, Claudio was one of the originals, and he passed it to a number of people in Berkeley, including Helen Palmer. And they would they actually signed that they wouldn't tell the world about it, and they did? That's the understanding that I have, was that it was passed to them on the understanding that it was not for general use distribution. And mm -hmm. uh, they, Helen Palmer apparently reneged on the agreement because she certainly became quite... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Famous and successful with her. Uh, yeah. Well, also the, there were the, there were priests using it, and they, the um, the Jesuit community in America, what Don Riso and others used it extensively, but they kept it more or less under wraps. Right. And but I'm always I've always admired their work because it was not used as a marketing tool or a quick fix or whatever, but it was really seen as a way to understanding ourselves, and as a way to not enlightenment so much as as acceptance of who we are and what we are and helping people by the right prayer and the right meditation mm -hmm. to learn right. and to see that um, everything in this is in us and in others and you know in fact I have a poem that says who am I but my friends in me who are they but the friend in me then what about my enemy who is he or she in me say we're all alike mm -hmm. and that's what the Enneagram as a psychological understanding at least has taught me mm -hmm. but we're talking about the purpose of life how can a thing like this knowledge this this understanding maybe you could call it wisdom be seen as something that needs to be secret why shouldn't everybody in the world know about it well, I believe that these schools were secret over time because uh, of prejudice from the mainstream religions against any kind of um, alternative thinking. Uh, there is a certain status quo that a lot of people are pretty invested in, and they're raison d'etre or their Weltanschauung, if we're going to mix languages, is uh, not necessarily to allow other people their um, path. It's to maintain their position and anything that comes in conflict with it to wipe it out. Yeah, but that's, you know, that's a historical thing. There's always a church or a status quo or, right. a, a, you know, an organization, the party, the church, the cult, whatever, which has its, and it's also based on, on true experience in the beginning, but it has its own rigidity, right? its own dogmas, and you have to believe, you have to follow the party line. And then there's always people say, yes, but it, even being inspired by the party line, the church, this belief system, 
we also look into our own reality, mm-hmm. what we experience, and we bring that in as a, an equal or as an even a better judgment of what, what reality is, because that's what we're mostly talking about. And that we've seen to history that a thing like Sufis that seemingly existed before Muhammad, but was like becoming the mystical part of the church has always been of the Islam church Mm -hmm. has always been slightly yeah at colliding courses with the more dogmatic mainstream church right the Islam because they had their own inspiration and they would listen to themselves and say you know find God in yourself it's more about the God in yourself, the horizontal God mm-hmm. versus the vertical God that Abraham and Moses, you know, Moses went to the mountain and he and he kneeled for God and then God said, you know, take off your shoes because I am here. So mm-hmm. that's the idea of a God really over us, right? taking care of us mm-hmm. as, as a different hierarchy versus the God in us. So, well, that's what we've seen. We've seen that with the Sufis and I'm sure that the, the Gnosis and the early church had the same difference. There was the Catholic church and there was the mystical schools and the mystical people and people like Anthony in the desert, those guys had different experience and a different thing. This goes all through history. Mm -hmm. And that is an explanation because they were at times called Qatars, Qatars, people who had a different view on their own spiritual experience. Right. Yes, at times not taking the church dogmas or, or in fact uh, fighting against them, but but they they came from a good source. Mm-hmm. You, you couldn't say they were bad people, right? Especially the Qatars in France were called les parfaits. They were trying to live a really good life. Sure, going against the church in its dogmatism at the, uh, of those days. But why keep it secret? Why keep that knowledge away from everybody? Well, I th- I think that. Uh there's uh, there's a complicated um, situation of forces. On one hand, spiritual knowledge is oriented towards humanity. The purpose of spiritual work, as I understand it, is to recognize humanity as one, as a unity. That the separation that we experience through these bodies is an illusion. That the reality is... We're all part of this energy thing. Yeah, exactly. And we're and we're only part of it, we are the whole and everything. And this is the mystical experience. Right. But that is something that most people during the course of their lives have. Or as the Jewish faith on some level believes that we all have it. Mm-hmm. But it might be at the moment of our death that we, right. we have a chance to become the enlightened one. To see the totality and the divine oneness yes right. the beatific this beautiful experience that that some people have early in their life later some kids have it uh for me when it happened it was a, a, a you know great influence that i realized all is one and i'm part of it and i am everything of it and there are no words to describe it right and when but that is something that a farmer might have and that a a learned priest might have or a Anybody Absolutely. has nothing to do with your training, having the knowledge, whatever. Correct. So why still come back? Why is there knowledge, esoteric knowledge? There's esoteric knowledge because uh, people have experiences and somehow build structures to re-experience those moments. Your mystical experience, you weren't under the influence of drugs? No, I was under the influence of, well, traveling for a few months and... and, and you know, being in nature and after a week of Zen meditation, starting at six o'clock in the morning to nine, a horrible experience. I didn't like it at all. But after a week being out in nature again, mm-hmm. something happened. Right. Samadhi. Samadhi, Samadhi, some understanding of uh, the oneness. Mm-hmm. The, the yeah, I, I, I can't even describe it, but... At that moment, I understood I'm one, and God is in me, and God is out me, and as the as, as the Hindu would say, the fullness without and the fullness within, mm-hmm. there is only one fullness. Right. So the dualities of life cease to exist. 
right. good and bad, holy and unholy, God and me, the, the, the separation, that's the whole thing. The Correct. separation she's to exist. Great. Still doesn't give me purpose in life. I just knew from that moment on I had to walk a different path. That maybe it, it, it sounds a bit big, but that I had to live in the, sh to, to, to walk, to live my life in the shadow of the love of God. Mm -hmm. There was no other way. Right. That this was, this happened actually when I was only 38 or 39. But for quite a period after that similar experience or other experiences happened that kind of fortified that belief that things were okay and that has become an, a very strong belief in me that yes there is no separation mm -hmm. that i do experience separation every day I, I feel the separation between me and the world and the other people and the you know jesus these chairs are you know uncomfortable whatever there's a separation mm -hmm. but there is no basic separation that those that's a learning process so I was lucky to experience that and have it fortified. And then only later I understood that not only Zen meditation or any kind of meditation, because I've, I had done transcendental meditation a long time before that, which didn't give those results. It kind of relaxed me, which was nice, but didn't give the, the um, experience that 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 moment of understanding mm -hmm. or not even understanding you can, it's it's beyond that moment of oneness right but later on i i kind of put it in in a framework and, and a book that inspired me was that um uh, chilton pierce oh yeah cracking the cosmic egg yeah because i was referring that experience to a very limited worldview really like god takes care of me and this and that and i i still had a feeling that it was like like a christian well i wouldn't call it christian but there was one god that took care of me to have this experience then i cracked that shell and i found myself in a wider shell which was partly due to drug experience because i found out that it's not only zen meditation other meditation that could get bring you to the state but also drugs electronic drugs brain machines Isolation tanks, uh, standing on your head, mm -hmm. uh, success, talking to 5,000 people. And, you know, there's all kinds of Absolutely. moments that bring you into, into this state, this, this awareness. So there were wider eggs. I saw wider eggs. And I, for a while, I tried to crack those to say, oh, yeah, 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 okay. I get beyond the Christian thing. I can be beyond even the religious thing. Mm -hmm. This is the universal love. How far do I have to go? Do I go beyond this world? I mean, I never went particularly strong for UFOs or extraterrestrials, but I started to be interested in the Hindu uh, wisdom, the Vedas, mm -hmm. understanding that they had to believe in other realities, other dimensions. Gee, it became rather big. And this book by Children Pierce taught me that you can crack endlessly. You can make a, you can, you can realize a bigger. Uh, cosmic egg and then you have to crack it again so see that cracking the egg is part of the whole process so give up mm -hmm. accept that you have cracked a few eggs and that you're probably in another one right but that is fine and that the process of cracking is not really helping you mm -hmm. it's just uh, a search right yeah and then we so we come back to the search is what what is the purpose yeah the purpose of life can be to find to find secret knowledge Mm -hmm. that we were talking about esoteric knowledge so you go out and it seems like people like Gurdjieff did that for a part of their life they went on and searched and searched and you know the cracks of the of the libraries and they went and learned strange languages to read the books that the Nakamadi papers and this to see if there are clues to deeper knowledge mm -hmm. what does it bring you in the end from the realization hey we're here it's fine it's now and that's all there is. Well, um, to Freda, I think, is the word you guys use in Holland. Uh, contentment. contentment um, serenity. Um, a, and an ability to share that. Um, the idea of sta sitting on a mountain and um, going into an altered state is certainly attractive to me. But somehow it 
for whatever reason, I haven't done that more than just, uh, you know, 10 day or uh, month long periods. Uh, what seems to be the trip is to find that space within oneself and be able to share it. Not necessarily yell about it, uh, though that's what some people do when they... Yeah, they become it. preachers, they become gurus. They right. sit and say, oh gee, I've seen many, you know, I have a center in Amsterdam, he's there. And I've seen many gurus, and sure. I've traveled the world, I've seen many gurus. Well, hardly any of them is perfect. They're all, they have a good side, and they're great teachers here, or great teachers there. But then one of them is stingy with the money, the other one is just, you know, fooling around with the girls, and the third is, is you know, Jesus, they're, they're never perfect. Now, they don't have to be. Mm -hmm. I'm only a little bit disappointed if a guy sits there and has 200 people, you know, like, for a few weeks, and seems to be the big guru and everybody says, oh, he's the new whatever he is. People right. uh, publicly say, oh, you were my master. And then at the end of the three weeks, I, being in a more worldly function, I have to deal with money and stuff like that, find out that some things are not happy. We have people in Amsterdam, um, you know, that are even f becoming fairly famous that seem to have a great gift for talking to an audience and expressing what the people want to hear, stuff like that. But in their personal life, they fuck up, basically. Mm -hmm. So many psychologists are great, you know, psychologists, and they, they, they're in their fifth marriage, and they're, you know. Right. So I've seen those gurus, and I don't think that that's the way that, that to, to, so to share it in a, in a directive way, in a hierarchical way, like I'm there and you're there and you will have to learn from me, does it work? I like the way of sharing that, for instance, brother David mm -hmm. shared with me at sometimes just being we're here. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. reality is now and this is great, fine. Right. We don't need any story, no references to whatever holy or guru right. person. Praise God and tie your camel. So I think there are certain, you know, we help each other tie the camel and we praise God. And we're, uh, I just read something, um, gratitude, attention, and compassion. Um, you know, often these little um, tidbits come in threes. And uh, so that's a good focus, is uh, to be thankful to the universe for manifesting me so that I can see it and be thankful. To pay attention to the game so that I tie my camel and I don't get a ticket because it's tied up until <laughs> 11 o'clock at uh, night and it's Amsterdam and uh, we have new rules here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm compassionate. You know, I feel for the policeman who's uh, taking my ticket. car away and uh, so I've tied my camel and put money in the meter. So. You know, these kind of things are the ways that I get through it. I don't know what I'm doing here other than being breathed. Being? Being breathed. It's because in the inhale, universe, exhale. Right, exhaling. The universe or the atmosphere of the earth breathes me. I exhale. In fact, talking may be the primary function of talking is to exhale. That as children, as as beings, we were all afraid and we all went, <gasps> and so we had to learn how to talk to force ourselves to exhale so that the earth could inspire us. I, another uh, clever idea that it, our purpose in life was to transport, transport water from one place to another. <laughs> because we're 90% of water. Because we're 70% water, we're the same thing as the earth which is 70% water and therefore we're mini earths and what the earth does is moves water around so we move water around. I mean like you can carry the analogy further because clouds for example I like to refer to the new age people as nuage which in French means cloud. Clouded. Clouded so the nuage, the new agers. The ones uh, who are with their heads in the clouds. Exactly. Well, what clouds are is basically water vapor moving through space and it's mostly air. So 
once again, we have this elemental view that reminds us that we are connected in everything. That, as you say, we're like these little chips that you can see the whole universe through, and at the same time you can see a little part of, but it's still connected. There's an expression in, um, let's see, I think, let's find the uh, right, it's Hare Krishna's, yes, the Hare Krishna's passed this one on. Achinta Beta Beta Tattva, which means a part of and separate from. That the experience of a human life is being a part of the world and yet separate from it. And that balancing act is... Okay, but let's take that to its extreme. I have experienced a time that I, that I have that capacity, and yet we have, uh, we both have, sometimes have used ketamine, and, and one of the things ketamine does is dissolves your ego. Yes. Yes? Correct. So you're not even separate from the rest. You are just part, you know, you experience, but there's no ego, there is no, there's no observer, there's no... No, there is an observer. I believe there is an observer. It may be that the observer disappears for some moments, and uh, but then the observer is what reports back on whatever you have. The difficulty is the observer, uh, you have to reach a meta point, a meta uh, above point, where you realize that the observer has his own lens, that you have your subjectivity. So that the most objective you can be is being aware of your subjectivity. Hence, we get back to the Enneagram, which I'll just mention, Ennea is the Greek for nine. So it's, a, it's basically a Enneagram is a, a form that has nine points, nine sides. So it's a circle with nine points in it. And the point of it is, as in many of these cosmologies, astrology or um, uh, there are various psychological uh, frameworks in which you can describe the personality, you can observe the personality, but the observer and the observer of the observer and that mirrors and mirrors is where we are. To, I think that we are a diamond of perception. It's as though this light shines through us and we're a diamond with many facets. We see all of the light moving through and it becomes a hall of mirrors. But the, the reality is that we are this diamond hard essence that doesn't change, that never died, that never will, was born, that is all the time. And it's only our awareness of it, or lack of thereof, that determines our state. That in uh, recognition is illumination. They're simultaneous. That when we recognize that we are one, that we are one. Yeah. Does that imply that if we don't recognize we're not one? That we not only feel the illusion of separation, but there is actually a separation? Mm, well, actually brings up this question of reality. You know, actuality, actual... Uh, yeah, but that's the funny thing. All these schools, what I've, you know, I've, I've in my life, I've traveled a lot. I've met many people. I've seen not only the Enneagram system or heard about the Arika school, which is a whole school with, with body training. And it's not only the Enneagram, it's a whole understanding of the cosmos and yourself and your place in it. But I've seen other ways. There is a human design system by Rauru who I have seen the Miru guy who believes in a strong connection between the mind, the things, the imaginative things, and reality through the hands, through the alphabet, through forms there. There is a mathematical way, mm -hmm. you know, the platonic solids seem to have in themselves form a link between one dimension, two dimension, multidimensionality, and if we understand multidimensionality, the meta cubes, the meta dimensions, geez, there are many, many ways to look at us reality our experience mm -hmm. most of this knowledge is not out on the streets correct yes what we see on television is well maybe sometimes we now see virtual reality which is why i was so fascinated by virtual reality because it seemed to be a way to tell people that there are other realities that right. we are only looking at the world always to our own lens mm -hmm. to our own film that what you see is that what you project yourself right in fact you're coloring that what's out there all the time Correct. So virtual reality, I thought, was a great gift to 
teach people about themselves turned into technological crap mm -hmm. you know hype internet cyberspace all an illusion mm -hmm. in an illusion in an illusion but i looked at that I, you know both the technology the electronic drugs the normal drugs all these knowledge why why does it have to be so hard mm -hmm. why do we have to go to a mystery school spent like you spent a long time in the Eureka system you're still more or less an Eurekan um, do lots of training it's like it's like yoga mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff why uh, well as Tim Leary said on his deathbed why not uh, I think we have to pass some time here on the planet and we choose the game in which we want to participate and uh, there was a book by de Rapp called The Master Game and in it he described uh, various numbers of games and one of them was the master game and the spiritual game is like the 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 big leagues for the ego it's where the ego really confronts itself and says oh I figured it out I don't really exist or maybe I do at least I can use this I this I am concept, which is in various mystical terms, the Godhead, mm -hmm. I am that I am. So, you know, some people say that the purpose of life is for God to see herself or himself or itself, that we are little pieces. It's a matter of recognition, right? the God in us and us in the God. Exactly. Uh, but why then these schools? Why do we have to go and I, 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 I plead guilty to this. I'm traveling around the world mm -hmm. and for a while I thought I was seeking for knowledge mm -hmm. and then I met this one guru who sold knowledge he said oh you can only have the knowledge if you follow my rules and right. he called it the knowledge Maya Raji and I got really pissed off you know because I hated a guy who puts up a barrier so you can only get the knowledge which turned out to be a few fairly simple meditation tricks of closing right. your eyes and stuff like that it's not it's not that complex but he made a whole show and he had hundreds of thousands of followers uh -huh. And I said, you know, knowledge, it's there anyway. I mean, we, we, knowledge is not, not important. It's like information, if it, if, it, if it changes you, if it has anything, but knowledge in itself, so what? Uh -huh. Wisdom is what matters. Uh -huh. And beyond wisdom, it's the, the thing that we, that we take in do something with it which, change, which, which really changes us. Uh -huh. The stuff that we hold, that we write down, that we call information is in fact, and that's where Gerald and Neil said, alienated experience. Stuff we experienced but not really put into ourselves. Uh -huh. We kept it at a distance. We kept it a separate knowledge. And then we even have schools, systems, you know, normal schools and esoteric schools and mystery schools where this knowledge this wisdom mm -hmm. is taught right beautiful system very complex part of it is it's so complex you get into it, then you become part of the whole system sure you invest your 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 time in it and then so you have to defend the system why isn't the purpose of life to be here now with all without all this crap all this knowledge all this externalized alienated experience and come back to the experience of the now well that's why I say I maybe our purpose is to be breathed so if we can just keep going whew, that's our purpose um, a lot of my life is spent in retrospect I mean I never experienced now it's always then I mean it may only be a 20th of a second which I think is the fastest human reaction time but I'm always a bit behind yeah. uh, Hence, law, love is always seen in the rear mirror, you know, oh God, I was in love with this. At the moment itself, you don't grab it. You can't stop time. Right. And um, so, I mean, maybe the purpose is, uh, is Wu Wei, the action of non-action. You know, thy will be done. Um, we had the experience. The total mystical thing. You're like, if we see the world as magic and mystic, mm -hmm. Magic being, you do something first with your hands, with your mind, visualization, magic. You know, right. you can do a lot of things from yep. your will. And then there's the other one that says, hey, wait a moment. I'm not going to do anything. Right. I give up. I let be. This right. is the mystical. But the two are intertwined. That's the yin-yang of, of life. Yeah, absolutely. So one, one half, you have to go out and seek this 
stuff, this knowledge, wisdom, mystery school, secret knowledge, looking into books, listening mm -hmm. to masters. And the other is, hey, I can sit in my back garden and God is there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or I don't have to sit, I can go to work and do my mm -hmm. job as a, a slinging hamburgers at a McDonald's. And I can also... That's uh, a Sufi way of also being. Right. You know, the Sufi says, have a normal life. Right. But serve God by doing it. And, and don't tell anybody, because if you do, you would be proud of yourself, and that's not... Right, exactly. That's the, the, the greatest stupidity of all, to become proud of how holy you are. Well, first there is a mountain, then there isn't. And then there is, you know. First there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. That was an old song in the 60s. And, and that it, it comes from the old understanding that the mountain is humanity. First you see reality, mm -hmm. then you realize it's an illusion. Right. And in the end you have to come back to the purpose of, but there is a mountain. And let me give up trying to understand it. There's the mountain, it's me. Right. Nirvana is samsara. Uh, I wrote a poem about that mountain. One time I took some LSD and was sitting on Mount Tamalpais. Mm -hmm. And this is the main line of the poem. Between me and the mountain, but God to enjoy. Me, the mountain is humanity, is what I see. And there's God, so there's the three of us. Me, reality and God. Mm -hmm. Now who is enjoying it? Is God enjoying the mountain? Is God enjoying me? Is, am I between me and the mountain, but God to enjoy? So God is in fact the enjoyment in that sense. Mm -hmm. And But the line has many meanings. You can look at sure. it in many parts. That God is in fact the enjoyment of me meeting the mountain mm -hmm. in a timeless moment. Now, is that your purpose in life? No, but it seems to be a gift that comes along that sometimes you sit somewhere, you see a stone or an animal or something. Some, in a timeless moment, you realize we are one. Right. We're there. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that at the moment you see a stone with your heart, with your being, you really see it, that the stone has the same experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah? That it opens his heart, his stone heart, and you open your heart, whatever, there's a connection. Right. And that is in his lifetime, which is much longer, but still finite. Right. You know, finite. Finite. That the stone has the same peak, exp peak experience as you have seeing it. Mm -hmm. And if you could live or go around and share that with whatever you see. And I think in a book called The Magic Monastery about, uh, not the Idris Shaba book, a book about Benedictine monks. It said, you know, that there was this one monk who learned to, to really love everything around him. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that he couldn't, you know, he couldn't love the stones he was lying on in his bed. That was his last purpose, to, to come to a total acceptance of everything around him as being perfect and make this connection. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that by using drugs or psychedelics or standing on your head for a few days or not eating or going to the desert or whatever, we come to a point where we realize this oneness, mm -hmm. that you remove the barriers between you and that other. No separation. Is that wisdom? I don't know. What I've learned from this Maharaji, I was really mad at a guy that he was setting up an organization for selling knowledge. Gee, God, uh -huh. what did I hate? But what I did write was this poem, <coughs> which says, wisdom is not knowing. You know, that knowledge. Right. Wisdom is not knowing, but feeling the truth. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is not knowing, but feeling the truth. Yeah, it's not. It has nothing to do with the mind. In fact, it is that you have to become the truth, and then it's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm only different because I have not yet learned to be the same. Right. I'm only different because I have not yet learned to be the same. And it's not only about people. Mm -hmm. It's about everything around you. Sure. As long as you feel different from the stone, from the people, from the world, from politics, from so. What's the purpose in life? I don't know. I, I ask people this in, in interviews sometimes, and one of, the, one of the interesting ways to ask it is, what are the boundaries of your love? Mm -hmm. Because if you, and you know, people, they might be gurus or whatever, and they say, oh, we love everybody. Yes, we love mainly, mainly the people around us and our followers and who, the people right. who buy our books and our videos and stuff. Great. Huh. 
But yeah, but there's these banks, you know, oh God, the Federal Reserve System or whatever, you know, or the, the CIA. Oh, so somewhere there is a boundary in their love. They have a limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we love everybody, but there's, there's the bad guys. Right. I think that life will, you know, what I understand from it is that you have to learn even to include the CIA. Sure. And your enemies, because they're probably your most valuable teachers. Well, Why do you hate the banks? You right. know, because you're probably not able to cope with money yourself. So that's, you need someone to blame. Well, I just read a quote from William Burroughs who said, if you're not paranoid, you're, if you're not paranoid, you're not paying attention. So now William Burroughs was a bit paranoid. Exactly. And he was, and a, he, did. he was a gay drug addict, um, deviant guy, yeah. but there's a level at which our perceptions may in fact be accurate. The issue is our attachment to them. A lot of people have to be right. Now, generally most people may not be right, but they're never in doubt. Hence, they're never in a space of being open to learning. I believe that part of the anxiety of being a human is that everything we've learned is based on question and doubt. All uh, when I travel around the world and have to learn another language, one, I'm in tremendous amount of doubt that I have the right word, and two, I have to ask questions a lot of the time in order to get new answers in order to learn. So there's a certain anxiety that is connected with the learning process. At the same time, those moments that aha experience, that ho-ho experience, when words somehow fit together and I'm able to make sense out of these sounds that God verdomme there te gek, man. <laughs> so that in itself is a wonderful moment. Now perhaps the moment, those moments of samadhi, of recognition, of satori, of kensho, of you know, maybe that's all our purpose is, is to climb back up the mountain like the myth of Sisyphus, to climb up the mountain for that one peak experience and then you fall back down the mountain and you go, what, what was, I remember, I was really good, oh yeah, I have to climb back up, and then you get up there again. I mean, this is the difficulty with psychedelics. They took people to spaces that were divine, ecstatic, wonderful, but they couldn't keep them there. I did this mystical work because I needed some software that would solidify my hardware so I didn't need to keep having uh, somebody uh, change the plug or plug into a different you know, drug, as it were. Uh, so I'm not plugging drugs. I'm just saying that altering your consciousness, is, I think, is part of the human psyche, part of the human condition. As you were saying about you continue to change because you don't recognize you're the same, what we notice is the change. If I go like this, you'll notice. If I go like this, you'll notice. But if I go like this for about a half an hour, or maybe 10 minutes, you'll stop noticing. Because that's the nature of the body. The body only notices differences. Maybe we're like a gap, like a synapse, between the material world and the spiritual world. That's, that's what, of course, a story is from many of these schools, is that we are, as human beings, unique in that sense that we are a bridge between dimensions right. what sets it apart from the apes or whatever is we are a bridge to to other dimensions um and other dimensions being a word for the holy dimension or for some people maybe their personal projection of that or personal experience of that is the ufo or right out of space whatever et uh, and for others it, it is the christian experience whatever right in the process of relating to the outside, relating to that what is outside. Reality is the basis of all, all psychology, or sorry, philosophy is how do, what is reality, how do we relate to, right. to it? But it seems there are a few processes there. We are afraid mm -hmm. of what's out there. Right. We're xenophobic, we don't like the new. Right. And yet there is another thing in us that wants the new. Mm -hmm. All this knowledge that we're seeking, sometimes I thought about it, like someone has seeded a world with all these mystical schools and books mm -hmm. and, and it's for, you know, it's for us to do the alchemic work, mm -hmm. going around in the world and read this book and find a reference to that and that person, he's telling you that. And then it comes together in very logical, slow steps. Mm -hmm. It's a slow process. So that finally we, we go up this ladder. Right. 
and you can expect a person who starts on the ladder, who has his first out-of-body experience, drug experience, other world experience, other dimensional, mm -hmm. you know, peeking into something else, to to be able to understand the fullness of the and the richness of what's out there. Mm -hmm. So you have to guide it. Right. And in the old days, maybe the system was well a little knowledge there and you plant it. Some people planted it in a library and you would find it. And I found it in fact by going around the world and this person would say, oh, go see the fire in the volcano. So I went to the volcano, I said, oh, go to Esalen, go to mm -hmm. this place, go. Right. So I, that's in fact, my, my original question was why does this knowledge have to be secret, esoteric? Mm -hmm. So I, in the same time, there's my answer is, maybe it is because we need a certain staging of it right and that blurping it all out and telling you the secret of the world wouldn't even hit home would it right yeah you might not notice because you have all this you know what is somebody said god invented time so everything wouldn't happen at once so that's you know i mean why are we in this time space uh continuum uh we know theoretically through our experiments and stuff, that uh, the Buddha was right. The Buddha, in his last moments, apparently, of meditation, uh, described the subatomic world, according to ancient Buddhist texts that I haven't read. But the point being that the spiritual and the, uh, the physical are somehow coming together, that you know we are somehow merging this paradox. Um, in the Eureka system, um, one of the axioms is man's purpose is to create void. That in order to realize our, our true state, our true purpose, it's void. It's, as I said, being breathed. We make a void in our lungs by breathing out. We then get breathed. Uh, you know, the purpose of life is to stay alive until you're ready to die. And then the purpose of life is to die. The Buddhists say the purpose of life is to get ready to die. So there's lots of different exercises to recognize that each moment is a death. Now, perhaps the anxiety connected with life and death and aging and all that would diminish with the recognition that it's just a transition, that every moment is a transition from the last and the big factor is our memory and where does our memory lie mostly in our words mostly in one yeah, but then you come into the linguistic thing where noam chomsky and other people have written a lot about right. how we are really tied up in our in naming and the story is that god created the angels and they were not allowed to name anything and then he created adam and eve and they were went around the garden of eden and they had to name things mm -hmm. and then the thing is to name is to frame right you at the moment you name something you solidify it in your mind right then you refer to it you don't say oh yeah well this is a thing and it's you know now uh, no now it's a chair right and you have in your mind the concept of a chair and if i close my eyes I, there's another concept mm -hmm. it looks different it might be different so naming is framing right linguistics form our whole life if we if we could understand the process, how that works, that we have in our mind little, you know, not only words, but memes, which right. are super words that yeah. describe, if we say democracy, we, wow, there's a whole thing there yeah. that we associate with it. Yeah. So if we could live without words, mm -hmm. but can we? The word was God and God was the word, you know, yeah. these things are... Right, but the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. So... Uh, you know, do we take the, the Western approach and make fun of it? Or do we take the Eastern approach and uh, uh, make light out of it? Mm -hmm. So in both cases, we're making light out of it. But uh, Yeah, light in different... <laughs> exactly. And the other thought I had To is light, that, that's what, what I remember. I was at Essendon one time, and I wrote a poem, and I only remember to lighten the light. Uh-huh. And my name is Luke, Luke, which means light. to lighten the light. That my purpose in life was to lighten the light, mm -hmm. which is make it not 
glow better but make it lighter because right. less heavy in the end i think the most esoteric knowledge is that you meet someone yeah. who says we're here yeah exactly that's exactly it so i think i think we're here yeah we are here this was joe farb for me stare talking about the purpose of life Um, I actually had this other thought, which was, as you were talking, yeah. maybe words are metaphysical gravity, or that there's some kind of process in which, by naming, we contract, we condense um, the, you know, the idea into a word, into a concept. And that that is the the internal manifestation of what we're experiencing. Because definitely gravity is a big thing here. Having just spent a week doing uh, the uh, tanks, the flotation tanks, I'm well aware of how gravity-reduced environment uh, alters one's perception, one's state of mind. So that was another concept I thought we might discuss.